Okay, so how is everyone today? Good? All right. Uh, last time, we were talking about um, antiderivatives. And uh, let's do one example of what we were doing, what we ended with last time. So an example of that would be something like, uh, we could say let P of T be, uh, how about uh, something divisible by three? So how about uh, 15 T squared uh, minus 12 uh, T mm, plus uh, eight, why not? Uh, and I, actually, I don't want this to be p. I want this to be p prime. So let the derivative of p uh, be that. And uh, p of, let's say, 3 is equal to 386. So suppose that, uh, suppose that is the case. Uh, I want you to find. Uh, P of T. Okay. So, uh, well, uh, on the one hand, this, this kind of exercise is sort of uh, trivial. I want to, you to sort of see it from the following point of view. And that is, what if I, what if I were to hand you a, a, a number and say that uh, this is not the number I'm I want you to give me back. It's actually just half of the number that I want you to give me back. And then I give you the number 13. What's the real number? 26, right? <laughs> if I just gave it, it was 13 and it was also half. So this is, this is, uh, this function I've written here is uh, not actually the function that I want. It's actually the derivative of the function I want. So, uh, you know, to go back to the 13 thing, you can imagine that I might have done this. I might have said, okay, the, the number that's in my head that I'm imagining and not, not revealing to them is 26. And then I'm going to half that and get 13. And then now aloud I say, 13 is not the number that I want. It's actually half the number that I want. Now you, so you do your thing to undo what I did. Okay. So how will we, uh, looking at it in that view, what do we need to do to this function. Sorry? The, I don't know, it's the integral version of the power of the so like 15t. Right, right. So we need to anti-differentiate. Yes. Yeah. So, all right. So then uh, p of t, whatever it is, that's what we're looking for, should be the anti-derivative of the derivative of p. So that's just like saying uh, 26 is uh, 2 multiplied by 1 half multiplied by 26. Right? Because the, the multiplication by 2 and a half undo each other. So what I'm saying is that uh, this is like uh, we've differentiated p and then followed it up by anti-differentiating p. All right. So the antiderivative of 15t uh, squared minus 12t plus 8 dt. Now, when I said 15t uh, squared, when I was writing it down, I said, oh, something divisible by 3. Uh, would someone care to speculate why, why that? Right, because, uh, well, because of the homogeneity rule and the additivity rule, that means that we can anti-differentiate anti each term. So what's the antiderivative of the term 15t uh, squared? 
5t cubed. Uh, and you know, just to sort of uh, labor the point a, a little hard, I'll say that it's, uh, it's 15 multiplied by t cubed over 3, right? So then uh, I wanted the coefficient to be the coefficient of this term to be divisible by 3 so that uh, this would turn out to be an integer. Okay. Uh, similarly, what's the antiderivative of uh, the term negative 12t? Very good. Okay, and then uh, now uh, I'm gonna just leave this this eight here for a minute. Uh, one of the reasons I'm gonna leave the eight there for a minute is to remind you that uh, you know if you have uh, ten terms to anti-differentiate, it's perfectly fine to do nine of them and leave one so that uh, you can look at it a little more to consider it a little more. Also. Uh, my experience tells me that uh, it's uh, likely that uh, a handful of you are going to get this wrong here and now, and if you're going to get it wrong, I'd like for you to get it wrong here and now instead of when we have a quiz over it. So uh, I'd like everyone to consider what, what is the antiderivative of 8 dt? 8 t. So uh, not everybody uh, made a noise. Uh, so then, uh, wait a second. I thought that uh, when you when you when you do this calculus business to, to eight, I thought you'd get zero, right? Because when you do it to a constant, you get zero. Yeah, the derivative of eight is zero, right? So why is it not zero? Right, because <laughs> we're doing the antiderivative. Okay, we're doing the antiderivative. In a sense, what this is asking, it's saying, uh, what kind of thing? is going to have slope 8 everywhere. A line that with formula 8t plus some unknown constant. Okay, so then uh, if, if even briefly it, uh, you considered that uh, the antiderivative of, of 8 dt should be 0, uh, that is like uh, you had forgotten that to, to turn the machine around. Right? This is antiderivative, not derivative. Okay, fine. So this is uh, 5t cubed minus 6t squared uh, plus 8t and then plus uh, some unknown constant. All right, so that's uh, the progress we've made so far. So uh, the c means that, uh, that, that uh, signifies that uh, you take this expression, 5t cubed minus 6t squared plus 8t, uh, and you can add any constant whatsoever and differentiate it and you'll get that back no matter what constant c. But uh, we're interested uh, in a specific, con at, at a specific uh, function p and it is in fact possible to determine the exact value of c uh, for in this case. What, uh, what piece of information have we not yet used? That bit, right? So now we'll use Uh, we'll now use uh, p of 3 equal to 386 to determine the value of c, which is to say that uh, this is like a machine. You know, p of t is a machine. And uh, what this is saying is that uh, you'll know that you have the right machine when it is the case that uh, input 3 produces output uh, 386. <coughs> so uh, P of 3, on the one hand, according to this, should be uh, 5 times 3 cubed minus 6 times 3 squared plus 8 times 3 plus whatever that unknown constant is. Uh, on the other hand, that sh uh, p of 3, we should be able to replace that with 386. And then I can use a calculator to evaluate all of that uh, arithmetic there. <laughs> Syntax error. Okay, what happened? Well, whoops. 
3 squared. Okay, so that's 105. So 105 plus C. Uh, then we can subtract 105 uh, to get 281 is C. And uh, as a result, we know that uh, P of T uh, is equal to all that stuff, 5T cubed minus 6T squared plus 8T uh, plus 281. Any question about this one? Okay, uh, now just uh, for, for your for your information, uh, in case you want to see more about this kind of kind of uh, problem, uh, for uh, non-math folks, <laughs> that's kind of a generalization. I would say, <laughs> right? meaning like uh, uh, like physicists, chemists, economists, and other people who use uh, math as a means to an end rather uh, than an end unto itself. Uh, this kind of problem is called uh, an initial value problem. Initial value problem. Uh, the reason for that name is that uh, imagine the following kind of scenario. Uh, imagine that uh, your friend calls you and says, oh, I'm at this party and it's it's awesome. I, uh, you, you definitely need to come. You, so you got to come to the party. And uh, and uh, uh, they say, uh, let me give you the directions. And they start giving you these directions that are just incredibly precise. You know, it's like uh, proceed 1.7 meters north. You know, and <laughs> turn 30 degrees uh, north northwest. You know, just super precise. Uh, you know, sub millimeter accuracy. And you follow all of these instructions to the to the letter, and uh, and then then when you when you've done that, uh, you say, "Hey, I'm I'm not at the party. I'm like in the middle of a field." And uh, and then your friend says, "Oh, I forgot. The, uh, you've got to start at my apartment." <laughs> right? These are the these are the sub millimeter accurate instructions of how you're supposed to move. This is, you've got to start at my apartment. <laughs> that's, that's what those are. So this uh, is called the initial value, right? The, the, the starting at your location, beginning at the apartment is this, where you initially are. This is every single step you're supposed to take from there. Uh, so that's why it's called an, uh, an, an initial value problem. Uh, for, for math folks, you know, just m mainly just if you just want to know uh, the math language for it, uh, these are called Cauchy problems. Uh, because there's a mathematician long dead named Augustin Cauchy, who's the first one to uh, mathematically rigorously describe uh, this, this problem. And in math, it's the tr tradition to name the thing after the person. Good. Any question about this? So if you want to look this up on like uh, YouTube or Khan Academy or whatever, you should probably type initial value problem. But uh, if you want to, you know, get a math textbook, you probably coach your problem. Good. Are there any questions about that before we move on to something entirely new? Not really entirely new. Okay, so now we're in section... Uh, 7.2, which is titled something like substitution. Uh, substitution. Uh, a better name <coughs> for this uh, would be something like uh, the anti-chain rule. Because, uh, well, here's the thing. 
Uh, in calculus one, you learned about derivative, and uh, you had to learn uh, about a lot of things. You know, the homogeneity rule, the additivity rule, and uh, li little things like that. And then you learned about uh, the product rule and the quotient rule. Those are usually done in a single lecture, more or less. And then the chain rule comes next, and uh, very often that uh, takes like two lectures. Because chain rule is sort of like uh, what's at the, the bottom of the whole thing. It's like uh, what causes all the machinery to work. Uh, sort of, and for, for that kind of reason, uh, bec because the antiderivative is the opposite of the uh, derivative, the, the inverse of the derivative, more or less we, besides the trivial things like uh, homogeneity, this is where we have to start. But uh, in the end, what, it's, what we have to do is we have to figure out how to undo the chain rule. Okay. So, uh, well, the chain rule says the following. That, uh, okay, if we compute the derivative with respect to x of f of x, and uh, we figure out that function, uh, the name that we usually give to that function is something like f prime. Uh, what I want you to see from this uh, first thing here is that the differentiation symbol and uh, the input symbol to the function are the same. They're both x. The chain rule uh, is kind of like as far as like uh, just a syntax is concerned, it's uh, sort of like asking, well, suppose that uh, we leave the differentiation symbol as x uh, and uh, that we make the input symbol something else, like, say, w. So, so that now, notice that uh, these are not the same. They're not the same now. Uh, because they're not the same, uh, that, that's going to show up. So it'll still be, the name of the function is still f prime, except uh, it's going to be evaluated at w. And now, because w did who knows what with x, w could have done you know, any kind of thing with x, uh, we need to also calculate the derivative of w with respect to x. So this uh, modifying the input symbol to the function uh, and then calculating the derivative and it, uh, this being the result is uh, the chain rule. Now there's an implicit, you know, if I just, uh, if I copy and paste this up here and uh, convert the w back to an x, then, uh, you know, then I write dx dx. But, uh, of course, what's dx dx? It's 1, so we don't write it. Okay. <clears throat> uh, again, the, the kind of thing that that's saying, so if we write... <clears throat> If we write uh, that w is some function g of x, uh, so that so that that uh, explains how w depends on x, then uh, what we're doing here, uh, what we're doing here looks like this. It looks like we're doing the derivative with respect to x of f of g of x, like so. So in a sense, what we're saying is that instead of like this taking input x and giving it directly to f and then calculating its derivative. What we're saying is that, uh, well, before, we, uh, before x gets to f, actually we, we push it through the g machine and g might uh, mess with it. And then we take the output of the g machine and use it as the input to the f machine and then we calculate the derivative. And the question is, is that, well, if you wire, if you wire two functions together, if you compose them like that, uh, what does the derivative look like? the answer is given by the chain rule and it says that uh, well you're gonna have to compute the derivative of f and you're gonna have to compute the derivative of g 
But uh, the thing is, is that uh, they're going to have to be evaluated at two different places. So notice that x first goes to g. So that means that the derivative of g is going to be evaluated at x. And then uh, the output of the g machine, g of x, is the input to f. So where's, where's this going to be evaluated? At just g of x, not g prime. So the question is, is uh, where is this, inside of this derivative, where is f evaluated? In between my index fingers. It's evaluated at g of x. So that means that the derivative is evaluated at g of x. So we evaluate uh, the derivative of f at its input, the derivative of g at its input. We take these two separate evaluations and combine them with what? Add, subtract, multiply, right? That's what the chain rule is saying. And uh, what we want to do is we want to uh, undo this. Now, this notation that we're writing right here, so the notation, dw dx. Uh, those uh, individual items, uh, dw and dx, they writing it like this kind of makes that looks like look like a fraction, uh, and it kind of also makes um, you know you might think uh, that dw is like a variable, like a, maybe it's the same kind of thing as w, right? W is a variable, maybe dw is a variable, and maybe like w over x is a fraction, maybe dw over dx is a fraction. And the answer is, no, that's not even close to true. <laughs> Actually, that's not, that's not true. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't really get into, in this class, in 1326, uh, what kind of thing dw is and what kind of thing dx is. Uh, in the sense that uh, we know that f is a function, but what kind of thing is, a D, is DW. Uh, depending on the context, it would, it's either uh, the, the kind of thing that it is is either something called a measure, related to something called a measure, or it's something called a differential. So I'm going to use the name differential in this class, uh, but uh, I just want to let you know that uh, it irks me a little bit that I can never really say exactly what that means. But uh, it's just like a word. Okay, so each of dw and dx uh, are <coughs> differentials. That's the kind of thing that they are. I think I'm running out of red here. <clears throat> Differentials. The ratio dw over dx, uh, so the expression uh, dw over dx looks kind of like uh, a fraction, just uh, visually. Uh, but it is not. Uh, however, that being the case, we're still going to treat it syntactically like a fraction. But it is not. Uh, it's not a fraction. So in some cases, uh, like 
captured it like uh, like what we'll see today. Uh, you can treat it like a fraction safely. But uh, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't be able to have uh, sweet mathematician dreams if I didn't give this disclaimer <laughs> uh, at the at the front here. That being said, now I'll be fast and loose with it all. Okay. So what we want to do is uh, undo the chain rule. <clears throat> so this is just copying that. Uh, that thing from the previous page. So that's the, just copying that. Uh, so now dx is not uh, a variable, and dw dx is not a fraction. But uh, nevertheless, uh, I promise you that uh, for some reason that we're not going to get deeply into, it makes sense for us to multiply both sides by dx. <clears throat> uh, so the result looks like this. And I'm going to put mult and <laughs> multiply in scare quotes there. Uh, DX. Oops. Oh, man. So now, considering the right-hand side, if those really were fractions, then what simplification could we make? The right-hand side. Yeah, the dx's would cancel. OK. Furthermore, if, uh, if the dx thing was still a fraction, uh, what can we do on the left-hand side? Also cancel the dx's uh, so that we have something that looks like this, d f of w is f prime of w dw. Uh, and again, just like uh, I'm not going to be real explicit about uh, what I mean by uh, dw. Uh, I'm also not going to be entirely forthcoming about what I mean by this uh, lonely d here. Uh, that lonely d is a thing, uh, and it has a name, uh, and it's dear to applied mathematicians like myself. Its name is the, the uh, exterior differential, but uh, I'm not going to say that again. <laughs> But I promise it's a thing. Uh, the, the only thing, uh, well, I'll just mention that, uh, yes, I said exterior differential, which uh, might uh, lead you to believe that uh, if the adjective exterior is being used, then could there be like an interior differential? And the answer is, yeah, there's all kinds of stuff out there. <laughs> it's all really beautiful. But uh, this is the one we're talking about now. Uh, more or less, the antiderivative, the elongated S thingy, uh, is like the undo of uh, the exterior differential. So now we'll we 
we will do that to both sides. So the antiderivative of the differential of f of w <coughs> is antiderivative of f prime of w dw. And uh, because uh, the antiderivative operator and uh, the little d operator are opposites, they cancel each other in the same kind of way that uh, the dx's, like here, cancel each other. So that's what's left is this. So now, uh, my claim is that uh, this, is a, this page constitutes a complete description of how to undo the chain. Okay, so uh, now I need to uh, hopefully make that claim real to you. Okay, so uh, this is a bit abstract, uh, so I'm going to move ahead uh, unless there's a strong objection. All right, so uh, I've got a question. What is the derivative of x to 5? This is not a trick question. 5x <laughs> to 4. Uh, now I have another question. What is the antiderivative of 5x to 4 dx? Plus a constant, right? So now, a couple things. So in the first place, uh, you, you, you could have done this one uh, just sort of straight away, right, I think. But uh, because this one's like re really pretty easy. Uh, but uh, I claim that it's like super easy because uh, first I asked that question. Right? <laughs> because, uh, you, know, uh, you know, this is like uh, I, I'm t I've, I've said, first, okay, you see that, sw that light switch? I want you to flip that switch and turn it off. And then uh, now I want you to now I want you to turn it back on, right? <laughs> so I want you to do the, do the thing and then undo the thing. Okay, so in that sense, this pair of questions is uh, kind of trivial. All right. Now let's do something slightly more entertaining. How about um, something like, <clears throat> please compute the derivative of the natural log of 3w, uh, sorry, 3x squared uh, plus uh, 5, like so. Okay, so now there's two functions at play. The last function to see anything is the logarithm. Uh, and the input uh, is x. Now, before, before, the, the, before uh, work gets to the logarithm, first we take the x and we do that polynomial business with it. And then after we've done the polynomial bit with it, then we give that to the logarithm. So first the polynomial thing, then the logarithm thing. Uh, as a result, uh, this is the composition of two functions. And uh, to compute the derivative, we'll need the chain rule. The pattern at play here is like this. We are differentiating with respect to x. The outermost function is logarithm. And then uh, the input to the logarithm is not x. Uh, it's some other combination of x. So I'm going uh, to give this a name. How about uh, u? Notice that uh, the differentiation symbol is x. The input symbol is u. Those are not the same. And uh, that, that means that uh, the chain rules action is going to be apparent. So what is the uh, derivative of logarithm of u? Or what is the derivative of logarithm of x? 1 over x. So this will be 1 over u. Uh, 
and then the action of the chain rule will be to multiply by the derivative of u with respect to x. Is there any question why that's the pattern here? Okay, so now let's carry this out then. <clears throat> so, uh, fine. This will be 1 over u and then multiplied by the derivative of u. So 1 over, two, 1 over u multiplied by the derivative of u. And then now for this one, uh, no more chain rule is necessary because that thing's just a polynomial. We can just use uh, the power rule more or less uh, so that this is a uh, 1 over 3x squared plus 5 uh, multiplied by 6 multiplied by x. Any question about this one? This one's okay? Sorry? Uh, <clears throat> all right. So were you gonna were you gonna take a guess as to what my what my next question was? No, I'll also let you continue. Okay. Any question about this? Does does anyone care to guess what I'm gonna ask next? I hope to be predictable enough for you to just say, yeah, I know. What am I gonna ask? Very good. I'm going to say now, okay, in that case, what's the antiderivative of 1 over 3 times x squared plus 5 multiplied by 6 multiplied by x dx? Yeah? Substitute u again. I have no idea what you mean by substitute u. I can't even imagine what you're saying. I've never heard of that before. No, I've heard of, I've heard of it before. But uh, I'm trying to make a, a point here. Have a look at uh, this pair of exercises. This one was, is, is easy enough where I could have just given it to you cold and you could have done it. But uh, it's sort of like especially easy because I had just primed you with this one. And uh, we just computed the derivative of a function, and got that. And now I'm asking, what's the antiderivative of that? That. <laughs> That's it, right? And then, yeah, and plus c. So uh, the answer is uh, logarithm of 3 times uh, x squared plus 5, and then uh, plus c to indicate the non-uniqueness. So uh, now, the, he, here's, here's the thing, is that uh, concerning this one, if, you, if, you, uh, you know, if, if we're in new territory for y'all, because I, as I understand it, uh, y'all's calculus one classes ended in different places. So some, for some of y'all, what I'm saying is entirely new and it's still review for some of y'all. Uh, if, you've, if you've never made it this far, if this is new to you, uh, I suspect that uh, if I had not given you that uh, previous exercise, it would be quite difficult for you to come to this answer. So the point of today is, uh, is for you to be able to arrive at this answer, uh, even if I hadn't done this, for you to be able to work backwards, more or less. So does everybody understand what the point is? Okay. So, uh, good. <clears throat> uh, here's the thing. Is that uh, last time, before we were talking about uh, today's subject and threatening to demonstrate how to undo the chain rule, um, we had uh, demonstrated, uh, listed out uh, a handful of antiderivatives uh, that we know. 
And in this class, it's, uh, we really know just uh, a few of them. We don't really know that many. So the name of this uh, remark is called uh, the Riesz, R-I-S-C-H, uh, algorithm. So the first step in the Riesz algorithm, uh, this is, this is uh, what it is, is this is how to anti-differentiate. So in the end, this is the name of the thing that, that uh, every calculus teacher, calculus two teacher has to impart. Uh, one, of the, one of the things is that uh, we have a list of known antiderivatives. So uh, one of them is uh, the antiderivative of x to n dx when n is not negative 1. So uh, this one is, has a name and a formula. Could someone give me one or the other or both? What's the formula? Uh huh. X to n plus one over n plus one, and then plus a constant. So that's the formula. Uh, you can see from the formula, uh, uh, you know, wh one of the reasons why uh, exponent negative one is not permitted, uh, because in the formula we divide by n plus one. If n or negative one, that would be zero, and uh, that just, that, that couldn't work. Uh, so what's the name of this, this one? The power rule. Uh, so then we have the, the single case uh, that uh, looks just like the power rule, but it's the, it is the one and only exponent that the power rule cannot deal with. That is to say, exponent negative 1. So the antiderivative of x to exponent negative 1, which is usually written as 1 over x, dx. So what's the formula or name or both for this one? Logarithm, yeah. Of absolute value, the most common left off thing there, plus, plus, uh, plus c. Uh, and this one's called the log rule. Okay, and then uh, the last one <coughs> is the antiderivative of the exponential. The antiderivative of exponential of x dx. Well, that one's exponential of x plus a constant. And this one's just called the exponential rule. Now, uh, in, in a sense, these are like the, the, the only three that we know. We don't know any others in this class. Uh, now, for every one of them, you could multiply them by a constant. Okay, but that's just the homogeneity property. Uh, you can add these together, but that's just the activity property. So what I'm saying is that uh, in some sense, uh, these are the only three that you are going to know in this whole semester. It's definitely not the case that these are the only three that are known in the wide world. Uh, you know, uh, uh, mathematicians, we've got to memorize all, a bunch of them, but, uh, but uh, engineers have to memorize even more of them for reasons I can't fathom, honestly. I could just look them up. But, uh, you know, like uh, every, every, uh, every reasonable science type ought to know how to anti-differentiate, at least these three and, you know, maybe, maybe a few more. But uh, there's hundreds but it, that, that exist and are in common use, but uh, these are the only three that we're going to use in the class. Uh, you know, the exponential case, uh, we went over that uh, a couple cases that are nice to remember, but they all really actually boil down to this case. like. Uh, how do you compute the exponential of a, 
non-natural base, well, uh, you know, just to remind you that a special case of this one is like uh, the antiderivative of, say, uh, 2 to x dx is uh, 2 to x and then divided by the natural log of 2 and then plus a constant. And in fact, uh, that's true of every base, 2, 3, 2.1, 2 uh, a million, pi, whatever, what have you. Uh, it's even true for base E because the logarithm of E is 1. Okay, but uh, I'm saying that uh, that's actually just, really it's just this one. Uh, so we have known antiderivatives. Then uh, last time when we were talking about antiderivatives, uh, we, we played some games where, you know, uh, you had to, you know, I like added things together and you just anti-differentiated each individual term. We even did that today. Uh, but uh, there was one case, at, or, or at least a couple cases, where I was able to make a pretty st standard calculus instructor joke, and that is that, which class did you take first, algebra or calculus? And then, algebra, you know, and then, okay, well maybe we should do algebraic steps before calculus steps. Okay, so uh, that's actually the second uh, step in the Riesz procedure. Uh, the, the Riesz algorithm, and that is that uh, can we perform uh, any algebraic manipulations to reduce uh, to combinations of one. So we, there we did n numerous examples of that last time. Uh, and all of the ones that we've done, uh, all of the antiderivatives we've done in lecture to date have either been exactly a known antiderivative or somehow uh, algebraic combinations of, of, of known ones. And so what I'm saying now is that uh, now we're going we're gonna to make this list a little bit longer. Step three. And uh, this step is uh, called substitution. Substitution. Uh, this is uh, the 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 question is sort of like uh, colloquially like asking, does it look like the chain rule was here? So uh, the, way the, the way the course goes is that uh, we're going to talk about antiderivatives for a little bit here, and then we're going to use them a little bit uh, to do some things. Uh, then we're going to develop uh, some more techniques to, for anti-differentiation, and then use them some more to do some things, and we kind of alternate uh, down, the, down, the, down the line. And the Riesz, uh, the Riesz algorithm that we're going to basically fill out uh, really only goes to about step five. So step one, is it a known thing? Step two, is it an algebraic combination of known things? Step three, can we make a substitution? Step four is a, is a mystery for now, I guess. Uh, but uh, we're going to build this up uh, all semester. So uh, was the chain rule here is the, is the question. All right, so let's have a look at that antiderivative we were looking at. It was 1 over 3x squared plus 5 and then times 6x dx. And so now here's an interesting aside. Uh, just uh, something I'd like for you to uh, take note of. The derivative, uh, derivative, of a polynomial of degree uh, 
uh, say, 8 is a polynomial of degree what? 7. If you differentiate a polynomial of degree 8, the result will be a polynomial of degree 7. And uh, there's nothing special about 8 and 7. But, uh, all I want you to see is that, uh, in fact, what the derivative does is it uh, lowers the degree of the polynomial by 1. Uh, so if you, if you input a polynomial of degree 13 into, uh, into the derivative, out will come a polynomial of degree 12. Uh, if you input a polynomial of degree 2, out will come a polynomial of degree 1. So uh, here's the thing. I'd like for you to observe uh, in, in, the, in the question here. In the denominator of this first uh, factor is a polynomial of degree 2. And uh, sort of over here and kind of to the side, I'd like for you to observe that... Uh, 6x, that's a polynomial of what degree? 1. A polynomial of degree 2 and a polynomial of degree 1. Uh, this is the first kind of thing I want you to take note of, is that notice that uh, we've got two polynomials and their degrees differ by exactly 1. That's notable because uh, you, it, it might be the case that if you differentiate the, one of degree, the, the polynomial of degree 2, you might get the other one. And that, that could be useful. Uh, furthermore, do you also observe that that is in fact the case? That the derivative of 3x squared plus 5 is in fact 6x? OK. So what I, what I, want, uh, you to, what I want you to observe is that uh, this being here, 3x squared, and uh, this being here, Uh, I claim that uh, this smells like the chain rule. Kind of looks like the chain rule was here. Okay. That being said, though, uh, we're going to do the we're going to do the Riesz algorithm. Okay. So the first step is that uh, concerning the concerning the antiderivative that's written right there, uh, is it exactly uh, one of the three known antiderivatives? So, like, is it like exactly one of the ones on the list? Is it exactly one of those? No, it's not. OK. Um, so does it doesn't look like it? No. Um, maybe we can perform some algebraic simpli simplifications like we did on Tuesday. Right? Because uh, if you remember, you know, I could, uh, I could, so here now we're considering can we do some algebraic combinations? Uh, notice that, uh, you know, maybe I'll put, uh, just to give us something to look at, I'll put the 6x up here so it looks like 6x and then 3x squared plus 5dx and write it like that. And uh, I'll remind you all that uh, we saw several antiderivatives of uh, fractions, divisions like that, and we were able to muddle through on Tuesday. Can we do the same kinds of things here? Okay, what? Sorry, I didn't follow. What quotient rule? There's a quotient rule for anti for derivatives, but. Uh, not one for antiderivatives. No. If if this was if I was asking you to differentiate this, you could you could get, get right to it. But uh, we're anti-differentiating it. Yeah.
So let me write what we did last time. Last time it was the case that we had something that uh, looked like this. We had a fraction that uh, took this shape. That uh, the numerator was the sum of two things, a plus b. And uh, what we said is that, oh, al uh, algebraically you can actually divide the denominator into each term in the numerator. Uh, and this, you can write this as uh, a over c plus uh, b over c. So that's, uh, that's a permissible step. Do you have a question? <laughs> we can, but uh, so, uh, but uh, I don't know what you mean yet. I'll know what you mean in five minutes. <laughs> and we'll do that in five minutes. But right now I need to uh, walk everyone through the necessity of doing such a thing. Uh, so this is fine. Uh, th this, is, this is what we did last time. Uh, uh, the reason why I'm sort of drawing this, the, uh, this out is because not the first time I've taught calculus. Notice that uh, this one is, this thing is kind of like that, but it's uh, actually the reciprocal. It uh, looks like this. Now it's, uh, instead of the sum being in the numerator, the sum is in the denominator. And the question is, is can we, can we do anything with that? You know, we, we were able to do something with the red, but can we, can we do a similar something with the green? And the answer is no, you cannot. You can't. Uh, what so I'm about to write something and it is, and it is seriously incorrect. So uh, if you're gonna write it down, please also carefully write down that it's incorrect. So what uh, students want to do, I suppose by, uh, by analogy to this one, they want to say something like, uh, this is A over B plus uh, A over C. But uh, that's not how arithmetic works. It doesn't work that way. Makes the greater sad. Uh, so you can't do that. So notice that uh, this one is, that is like the forbidden one, the green one, so you, you can't do it. Okay. So uh, other, than, other than something like that, uh, I have difficulty imagining what, what other algebraic thing we might, uh, we might try to attempt. Okay. So I'm going to say, I'm just going to just write this down as, you know, probably not. I don't see how we could do any algebraic thing to remedy it. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to do this new thing, substitution. Substitution. Which is uh, we want to try and undo the chain rule. So what I'm going to say is that uh, is for reasons that are not entirely clear, I'm going to say I'm going to let w be 3x squared plus 5. Uh, specifically, what I'm going to do is I want to, like, uh, I want to um, somehow uh, replace the x variables with w variables. Uh, so what, what we want to do is we want to, you know, substitute uh, x variables, uh, so x variables uh, for uh, w variables. Strictly speaking, uh, variables is not a very good name. It's more like uh, we want to substitute functions of x for functions of w, but uh, I'm going to uh, not stress that point. Uh, but here's the thing, in, uh, in the antiderivative, we've got this x uh, business here, expressions in x, and we've got 6x there, and we've also got this dx thing, and uh, dx is not a variable, it's a, uh, it's a differential, it's a, it's a different category of thing than, than x is. 
And uh, that means that uh, if we're going to substitute uh, x things for w things, that also means that we need to substitute dx things for dw things, right? Uh, so really, uh, the proper name for, for uh, this is not uh, substitution, but rather something called a variable differential substitution, which I'll write down in a minute. Uh, that being the case, what we want is we have, we're saying that w is going to be this. Now, I'm going, we're going to calculate uh, the derivative of w with respect to x. So what's uh, dw dx? Six x. That is, that is to say, what if you differentiate this with respect to x? So now let's uh, solve, just like we have w solved for on that line, uh, let's solve for dw. So what do you get if you solve for dw? Well, you get 6x dx. Just uh, imagining dx to be something you can multiply both sides by. So here, this is uh, substituting uh, dx differentials for dw differentials. And uh, what I w would like for you to observe is that uh, <clears throat> uh, doing all this, here I'm just going to copy and uh, color code this for us. So what we're saying is that uh, this red W, right there, that, is going to replace this part. So uh, all of that uh, expression is going to become a W. And similarly, uh, this, uh, when we make the substitution, is going to cover up what? All of this, right? And now, uh, concerning this, uh, what I have here, that part's covered in red, and uh, that part's covered in green. Do you observe that uh, all variables x and all differentials dx are covered? Every one of them is uh, covered by either red or green. Nothing is left out. As a result, uh, that means that uh, this here, this whole thing, uh, is a uh, variable differential substitution. And, uh, you know, people want to say, just call it substitution. And I get it, you know, because uh, uh, I'm lazy too, right? I'm a human just like you are. Uh, but uh, I find that uh, sort of repeating the true name of something, uh, calling it a variable differential substitution, uh, really helps, uh, at least at first, because what I find is that uh, a lot of students uh, sort of comfortably do this part, but then can completely omit uh, that part. It's not just a variable substitution. It's a variable differential substitution. Right? That's even like a maxim in several uh, cultures that, uh, that uh, the beginning of wisdom uh, is, is, uh, is uh, knowing the true name of something. Uh, fine, so then doing that, the new antiderivative in terms of symbol w now so 1 over red thing, and red thing is w. So that would be 1 over w. And then multiply by green thing. And what is green thing? dw. So now we have uh, significantly altered the original antiderivative.
right? The original one was that one. So uh, now that we've made this significant alteration to it, that means that uh, we need to start back at the top of the Riesz algorithm and ask, what's the first question in the Riesz algorithm? Yeah, is it exactly one of the ones that we know? Well, is it? Well, yeah, maybe yes and no, I would say. Uh, what is a, an alternative way to write 1 over w? w to negative 1. Okay. If not uh, this line, then this line. Is this uh, exactly one of the ones that we know? It is, right? Which one is it? The log rule. So uh, this would be the natural log of the absolute value of w and then plus c. Uh, all right. Is this the answer to the exercise? No. All right. <laughs> because, because there's a, well, in the first place, why would I have asked that question? <laughs> if, 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 if that was <laughs> the end. Uh, no, but uh, also there's, there's something called Betterge's rule of headlines, which says that uh, if, a, if you're reading a headline, like in a news article, and uh, the, it, and uh, it's a question, a yes or no question, then the answer is no. <laughs> is, this, uh, is this political event, does it mean the end of our republic? No. <laughs> is, uh, is this scientific finding going to mean that uh, we're all going to die? No. <laughs> is this the end of the exercise? No, <laughs> it is not. So why is, why is this not uh, the end of the exercise? Right, because uh, notice that the question was asked in terms of symbol X. Uh, at the present time, the, the uh, answer is phrased in terms of symbol W. So uh, that means that this is not the, not the answer. We need to get back to uh, X's. So that just means that uh, we need to recall that uh, W is that. So logarithm of absolute value of 3 uh, x squared plus 5 in absolute value, and then plus a constant. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you, you can leave it there, but uh, the homework uh, thingy, the online homework thingy, the whatever it's called, my math lab, it seems to make a, uh, a, a much fanfare about the following observation. And that is that, uh, well, cons consider x squared just by itself for a moment. Uh, if you square a positive thing, then the result is positive, right? What about if you square a negative thing? Still positive. So, uh, and if you square zero, you get zero. So this term by itself, 3x squared, the smallest it could conceivably be is zero. It's going to be, uh, and it's zero when x is zero and it's going to be positive otherwise. And then you add 5 to it, which means that uh, the input to the absolute, to this absolute value is five or more, which means that the input to that absolute value is always positive, which means that you can drop the absolute value. And uh, if I recall correctly, uh, my math lab uh, for some exercises uh, will not give you credit if you don't uh, realize that you can drop the absolute value uh, in this case, but uh, also, the absolute value, it also understands when the absolute value is necessary and it will not give you credit if you don't have the absolute value. So you need to pay close attention to that. So uh, this, is, uh, this works, that step right there, uh, because 3x squared plus 5 is uh, positive for all x. <clears throat> Any question about this example? Okay, good. So uh, now what we're going to do is, uh, now that we've sort of really labored out uh, an example like this, what we're going to do is just do lots and lots of examples of it so that uh, you can kind of, kind of get uh, a flavor for all the different possibilities uh, that could show up. Okay. So here's an example. How about, uh, please compute the antiderivative of, uh, I don't know, 
13 uh, P plus 26 raised to exponent 3 uh, DP. Okay. So, the Riesz algorithm. What's the first step? Right. Is it, uh, is it exactly one of the three that we know? It is not, right? It's not like exactly one of those entries. By the way, uh, you know, uh, notice that uh, strictly speaking, uh, on the previous page, we got to a place where it said antiderivative of w to negative 1 dw. Uh, and I asked, is that exactly one of the ones in the table? And y'all said yes, rightly. But uh, wait a second. That one says uh, antiderivative of x to negative 1 dx, not antiderivative of w to negative 1 dw. So I, this one, I guess, is not really in the table? Or what? Yeah. There, there's nothing sacred about the name. The only thing in the end that matters is that uh, this symbol, x, is in agreement with this differential dx. w and dw, y and dy, banana and dbanana, as long as they're uh, agreeable. OK. So is this exactly one of the ones uh, in the table? It is not. Uh, well, it's, no, I, I, I can't entirely agree there, because uh, the power rule, it's got to be, uh, you know, it's got to be whatever is to n, it has to be d, d that same thing. So if this is x, then that's dx. And now, if whatever I'm covering up, am I covering up, since that's a dp, am I covering up a p? Oh, well, yeah, but uh, is it exactly a p? It isn't. Right? So then, now, I agree with your intuition that it, it, it uh, kind, of, kind of looks like a power rule. I agree entirely, and we're going to use that. But uh, I'm just saying that, it, that uh, this is not one of the entries in the table. It's not exactly one of these. Okay. Uh, what's the next step in the algebra, right? Now, uh, strictly speaking, we can do something here. What can we do? Yeah, we can just multiply it out, right? Wouldn't that be fun? Uh, we could multiply it out. We could, uh, you know, do it like this, like a 13... P uh, plus 26. We could square that, and then once we've squared that one, then we could uh, bring in the other one. Right? Uh, because everyone likes doing that. Right? Uh, you could do that. Uh, but uh, then I could give you another exercise where instead of making that a 3, I make it like a 33. Then, in principle, still you could do it, but uh, it's starting to get. Uh, no good, right? So even, even this one, I would argue, is no good because uh, my experience tells me that uh, most, most people actually can't successfully do this <laughs> uh, accurately uh, under, under a time constraint. That's, that's, that's why human beings organize ourselves into cultures so that we could make machines to do it for us. Right? That's, as far as I'm concerned, that's, that's like one of the main reasons why. Okay, we could, uh, but, th but that would be, uh, but uh, m maybe w we'd like a better way. Okay, so if we're gonna, if we're gonna say, uh, we're going to make this a soft no. <laughs> right, so I think we all agree that, uh, in principle, you could, but let's make it a soft no, so that uh, maybe we can uh, 
uh, consider a substitution. All right. Uh, now, I agree with your intuition that uh, this is kind of like the power rule. Now, it's not exactly, it's not like exactly one of the entries in the, in the table of known antiderivatives, but it's kind of like it. Uh, what's happening here is that uh, if this, if what I'm covering up uh, was exactly a P, it would be, a, it would be the power rule. Uh, but it's not, it's this uh, 13P plus 26. Now, that's a polynomial in P. Uh, what is the degree of 13P plus 26? Degree 1. And uh, if we, that means that uh, if, we, and if we differentiate something of degree 1, a polynomial of degree 1, what kind of thing should we get? A polynomial of degree 0. Now, uh, that sounds kind of weird to say, but uh, that's a constant. So like uh, 7p is a polynomial of degree 1. Its derivative is 7, which is a polynomial of degree 0, a constant. So, uh, so does everybody see it? We can, we can stick a constant uh, anywhere we want. Like we can imagine that there's a 1 there. So like here, inside of here is a polynomial of degree 1, and outside of here is a, a polynomial of degree 0, a constant. OK. Let's try a substitution. Uh, let's make a. You know, I used uh, what I used on the previous page. W. Uh, I'm going to use a. I'm going to use a v. We'll try a v. Uh, now, in the book, almost uniformly, they seem to use a u. But uh, and when I when I first was teaching calculus back in the day, I would always use a u. But uh, I find that uh, if w when I do that, when I always use a u. Uh, students kind of like uh, think there's something intrinsically magical about the letter U, and there's not. So I'm just uh, like just going over the alphabet. That's what I'm doing. Uh, the only letters I won't use is D. <laughs> that one would be confusing. <laughs> D D. What would that mean? Uh, v. <clears throat> Suppose that V is 13P plus 26. The rectification of names. That's the name of that, uh, of that thing. Uh, so what's the, what's the true name of substitution? A variable differential substitution. So what we're saying is that uh, we want to trade variables P for variables V. Uh, so P's for V's, uh, but that also means we need to trade what for what also. Yeah, DP things for dv things. So this is how we're going to trade variables, how we're going to substitute variables. Now we need to establish how we're going to substitute differentials. So how do we figure out how the differentials substitute? How do we do it on the previous page? Yeah, we need, to, we need to compute the derivative of this variable, of this new variable, with respect to the old variable. So d, v, d, p. So what, uh, what is the derivative of 13p plus 26 with respect to p? Just 13, right? Uh, because the derivative of 26 is 0. So this would be 13. Uh, fine. So now uh, we need to solve for dv. So dv is what? 13 dp. Okay. Now let's uh, assess where we are. Uh, so uh, just copying this antiderivative here just so I have something to sort of look around at. So 13 p plus 26 cubed uh, dp. Uh, what we're currently uh, suggesting is that v 
is going to uh, replace all of this. And uh, this is saying that uh, if I had a 13P, uh, sorry, a 13DP, then I could replace it with a DV. But uh, it doesn't appear to me that I have a 13P. It appears to, uh, 13DP. That's what I need, but uh, that's all I have. So what can I do? What do you mean change? I need a, I need a solitary DP. Ah, we can divide both sides of that one by 13, right? So we can say D uh, V over 13 is DP. Yes. So now we have a solitary DP. So that means that uh, this DV over 13 uh, will cover this. So now, uh, con considering this now, uh, do you observe that uh, all the P stuff and, and also all of the DP stuff, that is to say all the variables and uh, all the differentials are all covered? So they're all covered. So uh, what about the three? What? Leave it. Leave it? Yeah. But okay, then why didn't I leave the DP? Do we need? I mean, you know, like for some reason it's not permissible to leave the TP, uh, the D, the DP, but uh, we can just not not mess with the three. Okay, good. So what is the name of this process? What's its true name? Variable a variable differential substitution. Is three a variable? No. Is three a differential? We can leave it. It doesn't need to be substituted. It's just uh, it's a constant. Uh, so, uh, what is the uh, what is the new antiderivative in terms of the new variable v? cubed, and then what? Very good. dv over 13. So any question getting to this position? Now, division by 13 is the same as multiplication by 1 over 13. Uh, and antiderivative is homogeneous, which means that uh, actually you can factor out a 1 over 13. But uh, eventually, when you get comfortable enough with this, uh, we'll end up just leaving the division by 13 in there when, when you get your head completely wrapped around all this. Uh, so now, we've significantly altered the original antiderivative, uh, which means it's time to do what? Go back to the very first step of the reach algorithm. And, we, and what was the very first step? Is it a known one? Well, is it? Yes. It is. Uh, which, which, which one of the three is it? Power rule. OK. So this 1 over 13 just hangs out. Uh, what is the antiderivative of v cubed dv? No? There you go. So by the way, uh, just to check your understanding. So you, you had said uh, 3v squared. So what had you, what had you uh, actually done? Yeah, you differentiated it, right? Okay, good. Just making sure. I'm not like picking on you. I just want to just make sure that uh, the matter's clear. Because here's the thing. Uh, you know, y'all might find yourselves teaching someday. And, uh, you know, teaching, there, there's, a lo there's a lot of work. Like, uh, there's a lot of little facets to, to what I have to do. Uh, and uh, part of an important, no doubt, part of my work is to stand up here and do this. Uh, but uh, another part uh, is to give you reasonable assignments and to grade them. And uh, grading, I'm telling you, is is a a lot of work. And uh, there's two kinds. Uh, 
two kinds of things that are exceptionally easy to grade. One of them is a blank page. That's real easy. <laughs> Uh, the other one is when uh, the answer is completely correct. That, uh, that takes just barely longer than a blank page because uh, completely correct and neatly organized work is obviously correct. The stuff that takes a lot of time is uh, when something's just partially correct. Then I have to kind of you know, imagine what you might have been thinking at that time and figure out uh, to what extent you deserve partial credit and that uh, takes a lot of you know, mental work. As a result, uh, you know, m me confirming that you knew what mistake it was and that you knew what to do next was in, in that way kind of like a completely selfish thing for me, right? <laughs> because uh, if, you get it, if you get it exactly right on the, on the thing, it's good for me. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would love it if all of you submitted completely correct work. Okay, good. Is this the answer? Okay, why not? Back to P's, right? So 1 over 13, and then uh, 13 P plus 26 to exponent 4 over 4 plus a constant. Any questions about this one? OK, so I have a question. I have a question. So uh, notice that uh, you know if uh, if I just uh, sprung this thing on you here, and I said uh, we're going to differentiate that with respect to p, uh, then that c is a constant, so it would just differentiate away. So that's not you know that that part's not very interesting. And then uh, we could collect th this uh, division and that multiplication. Uh, into, you know, a single constant out front, 1 over uh, 52. Uh, and because the derivative is homogeneous, in, in some sense, the, these, these constants don't really, uh, don't really do much. So like the constants, in, in, in some ways, the derivative is kind of like blind to them. Or you might say that what the derivative does with them is obvious. But uh, just this part that's left here, suppose we wanted to differentiate that with respect to p then what would we need to use? The, the power rule and the chain rule. And uh, I claim that uh, it should be entirely and utterly obvious why you'd have to use the chain rule. Why? Well, yes. But uh, even if I covered this up, even if we covered all this up, uh, and I said, uh, you know, we're going to use, here's an antiderivative. We're going to use substitution to, uh, to evaluate that antiderivative. What, what do you think you'd have to do to evaluate the derivative of the answer? <laughs> the chain rule. Why? What's the relationship between uh, the chain rule and a variable differential substitu substitution? They're inverses of each other, right? This is this procedure that we're doing on the page, is is running the chain rule machine in the reverse direction. So it's it's you're like undoing it. So if this, so it, what I'm telling you is that uh, it should be entirely natural seeming to you, that uh, if when you look at this, if you imagine what would it be like to differentiate this with respect to p. It's going to have to use the chain rule, because we got it, with a substitution. So you know. In that sense, of course. All right. Uh, how about uh, how about this one? Uh, antiderivative of t squared uh, multiplied by the square root of uh, eight t cubed uh, plus Five dt. Okay. 
So, uh, well, essentially every time you want to do an antiderivative, it's uh, immediately to the top of the reach algorithm. So I'll just, I'll just ask. Is this one of the known ones? It is not. It's not one of the known ones. Uh, can we do some kind of algebra madness? Are you sure? Because uh, isn't like isn't like square root? Doesn't that like uh, can't we look at that some other way? Yeah, fractional exponent half. So let wait. Let's look at that. Uh, so like this t squared, and then uh, like this eight t cubed plus five half dt. So are we not going to be able to do anything with that? Well, like, what, why weren't we able to do something we, we, we uh, mentioned in passing, but then passed over the option of doing this on the previous one? Why, why can't we do that? So, I mean, in principle, we could have done this, right? Because uh, what that exponent 3 means means uh, whatever you're covering up here, that exponent 3 means make three copies of thing and then multiply them all together. So if that was 33, that would just mean we just make 33 copies of this and multiply them all together, even if it was 333 million. In principle, we could make 333 million copies of this and then very carefully multiply it all out. Uh, but more or less, uh, you can't really do that here. Uh, there's a lot of reasons, but one, way, one kind of intuitive reason is that uh, look at this half exponent and ask, what would it mean to make half a copy of this thing? Square root. <laughs> well, it means square root, but uh, I mean like procedurally, right? You know, like how do you like write it? I don't know. Okay, so then, uh, no, there's nothing, there's nothing algebraic we can do. All right, so then uh, the next step is a variable differential substitution. All right, so now that, uh, now that our hand's been forced, uh, I'd like to point out that uh, just having a glance at this antiderivative, I see two um, polynomials. I see the one that's outside the radical, and I see the one inside the radical. Now, what's the degree of the one outside? Two, it's degree two, and what's the degree of the one inside the radical? Three, and what's notable about that situation? They're different, but uh, we need more specific. They differ by one of them could be the derivative of the other. Yeah, they differ by one, so it's reasonable that uh, one might be the derivative of the other. Uh, and moreover, uh, they're not being added together or subtracted; they're being multiplied or divided. And that's that's a necessary part because. Uh, in the chain rule, you evaluate the derivative of the first function at its point and the derivative of the second function at its point and multiply them. Right? Uh, now, if, uh, if this was like, uh, say, instead of, uh, like this one, in if this was in, in, instead of t cubed, if it was like t to, eight, uh, t to 9, say, then this one would be degree 9 and that one would be degree 2. And, uh, that would not bode well for the chain rule. Because uh, even though they're both polynomials, that's great, but uh, their degrees don't differ by one. So that wouldn't, that wouldn't be good. But uh, this is degree three, that's degree two, they differ by one. So that, that sounds good. So let's make a, let's make a substitution. All right, uh, fine. The first thing I'm gonna try is, uh, you know, because for some of you, this is, this is new. It may not be entirely clear uh, which one you're supposed to use. Okay, so I'll try uh, saying that uh, I'll use t squared. Maybe t squared is the right choice you know, because uh, I'd like a 50-50 choice. It's either gonna be the one polynomial or the other. Okay, so uh, because I know its true name is a variable differential substitution, uh, if we're gonna substitute variables like this, then what else do I need to figure out? 
the, the, the differentials, right? So then dx dt, that'd be uh, 2 mm, t, like that. And then uh, dx would be uh, 2 t dt. And then maybe I'll just get rid of the 2 for a second and look at it like this and say uh, dx over 2 is t dt. Okay. So now, if I just copy this antiderivative for a moment, t squared, eight t cubed plus five dt. Then uh, what's currently on offer is that uh, we'll cover uh, t squared with x. But then, uh, I don't know. It's not looking good, right? Like, I don't see a t cubed. You know, it's like, it's just not looking good to me. It's stuff's not lining up and matching up. OK. Well, uh, you know, I'm up here yakking. And it's been about two minutes. But that's not, uh, that's not so big of a loss. Uh, what I want to encourage you to do is that, uh, especially at the beginning, when you're, if, if you're not uh, real comfortable, just write it down. Just have a look, especially when there's a 50-50 shot. Uh, so I would guess that I've got a pretty good chance of getting it right the next one. So this one didn't work. Uh, I could. Uh, but the, I, so I take it to mean that you're saying that you'd want a T over here? Uh, generally speaking, that's a bad idea. Uh, what I mean by that is that uh, your substitutions, you want uh, all of one variable uh, on one side and all of other variable on other side. So in principle, there's nothing wrong with dividing by a t, but uh, then you kind of violate the heuristic that uh, then you have x's and t's on the same side. So that's kind of a bad idea. So this one's not going to work. Uh, this one's not going to go anywhere. So I'll try, you know, I'll just sad face there, but uh, all right. I'll try this one. How about uh, y is uh, the other thing? y is 8t uh, cubed plus 5. So we'll try that variable substitution. Uh, so what's the thing that uh, always immediately follows uh, one of these? The variable? The differential. So now dy dt, uh, which in this case is uh, 24t uh, squared. And then I can solve for dy. dy is 24t uh, squared dt. And then, uh, well, 24 doesn't look so awesome, but uh, the t squared dt looks kind of pr pretty much okay. So what do I do with the 24? Okay, divide. So then uh, dy by 24 is t squared dt. So I'm going to copy, you know, make another copy just to, so I have something fresh to look at here. So t squared. And eight t cubed plus five dt. So what's currently on offer is that uh, we're going to replace everything in the radical with a y. So that's all going to be covered with a with, uh, with a y. And uh, t squared dt. Now, uh, in this uh, right here, are t squared and dt side by side? Okay, uh, why not? Right. So uh, the the thing that matters is that uh, all of these are multiplied together. So this this bit is what's getting covered by uh, by this. And uh, just to you know, just to help your visual system cope. I'll make another copy of the antiderivative, except I'll commute the order of the multiplications and make it look like this, square root of uh, 
8 t cubed plus 5. And then now I've commuted the t squared to the right side like that. And now it, the substitution looks like this. So can you see that uh, for this substitution, all variables and all differentials are accounted for? And uh, the square root, you know, we already mentioned that uh, it corresponds to fractional exponent half. Do we need something to substitute for the half? No, because it's not a variable or a differential. It's just a half. Uh, as a result, um, the new uh, antiderivative in terms of the new variable will be square root y and then uh, multiplied by dy over 24. Any question about this? OK. So uh, good. This will be, uh, I'll factor out the 1 over 24. Multiply by y to half dy. So now the, uh, this antiderivative has been significantly altered uh, from the original, which means what? Back to the top, right? <laughs> Back to the top. Is it, uh, is it exactly one of the known antiderivatives? It is. Uh, in fact, it's the power rule. Uh, so the uh, continuing here, this is 1 over uh, 24 multiplied by y to exponent to what exponent? One and a half? Right. So I'll write uh, three halves. Three halves. And then divide by three halves. Uh, plus a constant. And then getting back to the original variable. One over 24 times, uh, what do we say? Why was that, that thing? Uh, eight t cubed plus 5 to exponent 3 halves, all of that divide by 3 halves, plus a constant. Any question about this one? So uh, one of the things that uh, I'll just mention about this one is that uh, when you're going to try a substitution, uh, it is often a very good idea to, uh, if there's a radical in there, like a square root, it uh, is very often a good idea to try and make that, the thingy in the radical, be the, the substituted thing. So uh, when, I, when I tried this substitution first, uh, it violated that principle, right? If we had if we had had that working that working rule, we would have said, no, no, no. Uh, if I have to choose between if I have to choose between the thing that's outside the radical and the thing that's inside, I'm gonna try the one inside first, because the square root's what's causing all the problem. If uh, if somehow we could if we could make the square root simpler by making it just a single symbol under there, that would be great. So uh, generally speaking. Not in every single case, but generally speaking, it's a good idea to try the thing inside the radical first. Uh, good. What variables have we not used here? How about z? Uh, so how about uh, this one? Uh, z plus 3 antiderivative uh, over z squared uh, plus 6z. And then all of that in the denominator is squared, and then dz. Uh, 
Uh, by the way, just to, we'll do a little self-check here. Uh, would you please write uh, 22Z? Just somewhere over to the side. So uh, anyway, that's how I write 22Z. Uh, if you take a look at what you just wrote, if you, if you wrote something that looks like this, then uh, you need to stop that. <laughs> this is a math class. <laughs> okay? Uh, your, your, your twos and your zs need to look different, you know, and intelligible. So uh, I write my z's uh, with, the, with the cross mark uh, to, to make them as visually distinguished from twos as possible. And I make the twos have a curvy thingy to make them, uh, you know, visually, you know what I'm talking about, the, the curvy bit, you know what I'm saying. Uh, just to make it clear that it's a two and not a z. Okay. Uh, good. So we're doing the Riesz algorithm here. Uh, so is it known? No, it is not. Uh, can we do some algebraic nonsense? Okay, are we sure? Because like uh, this time it's got a sum in the numerator. So that means that in principle we could split it. <laughs> but we don't want to. <laughs> so let's, uh, you know, just to make sure that uh, we're all clear about what I'm, what I'm suggesting and why it's not a great idea. What I'm saying is that uh, you could do this. Uh, I want to write it a different way. I want to write it like this. So that's a, that's a legitimate uh, operation, uh, but the question is, uh, is it useful? I think not. You know, I don't think it's going to be useful. Okay, so, you know, who knows? Probably not. Doesn't look like it. Uh, so then, if, uh, if we're not going not gonna to go with the algebra thing, the next uh, possibility is a variable differential substitution. Uh, notably, I hope you're noticing a pattern here that uh, I spy two polynomials. One of them is degree one, and the other one is degree two, and uh, that's uh, good because why? Yeah, because they're one away. Uh, if they were like uh, you know like uh, two away, that that would be bad news. We would we wouldn't be able to you know we wouldn't be able to use the tricks we currently know. Okay, uh, now, besides uh, the heuristic of um, w w when you have a radical, choose the thing that's in the radical, uh, also, when you're making this observation about uh, polynomials whose degree differs by one, uh, and you want to make a substitution, which one is supposed to be the variable? The, the one with the greater degree. Because you're going to differentiate it resulting in re uh, reducing the degree by one. So you want to choose the polynomial of greater degree. Uh, as a result, uh, Z, A, uh, uh, B? No, Bs look too much like sixes. K, we'll use a K. K is a good letter. Uh, I'll try, K is what? What are we going to substitute? Okay, good. Z squared plus 6Z. Okay? So, uh, so we're, you know, uh, I want to sort of emphasize the tentativeness of this. You know, we're like, uh, we're, we're offering, we're considering that uh, maybe Z squared plus 6Z would be a good thing to substitute. Uh, the way that uh, we continue this consideration is by doing what? By differentiating and calculating dk dz. So, what is dk dz? Okay, very good.
good, 2z plus 6. And then uh, what we need to do is solve for dk. All right, so I'm going to do that, but I'm going to make a mistake. dk is 2z plus 6 uh, dz. It's kind of hard to make this mistake. It even, look, it even looks bad because, uh, you know, I'm in the habit of writing the dots, you know? So, like, I'll write the dot. Now it's, now it's a little bit easier to not observe the mistake. But uh, nevertheless, there's a mistake. What's the mistake? Right. Is that uh, dz has to multiply... All, all of the right-hand side. At the present time, uh, it's only multiplying the 6 because of the order of operations. Right, so parentheses are missing. Uh, oops, I'm going to make these green. Okay, so then uh, what's currently on offer is that uh, this is our... Uh, antiderivative here, z plus 3 in the numerator over, uh, what was it, uh, z squared plus 6z, square all that, uh, dz. Uh, what's currently on offer is that uh, we're going to replace all of that with a k, and, uh, uh, well, to do this, we'd need a, a 2z plus 6. But I don't, I don't see a 2z plus 6. Ah, right? This, uh, this thing, 2, 2z plus 6, it has a common factor, right, of 2. So then dk is 2 multiplied by z plus 3. Oh, how convenient, right? Uh, convenient, right? Because uh, you know there's a there's a three, you know, a z plus three right there. Uh, now, if, in case it's not clear, uh, I'll rewrite this slightly and write this as one over z squared plus six z uh, all squared, and then multiply by z plus three. Dz, so that uh, I move the numerator over, leaving a one, and then write, wrote the numerator as a factor. Uh, okay, so uh, is it okay if I just say I'm going to divide by the two? Are we all clear? I think it's probably clear. So dk over two is uh, z plus three dz. So what we're saying is that, uh, okay, this we're going to replace with a k. And uh, this. And uh, that one for that. So again, all variables accounted for, all differentials accounted for. Any question about getting to this place? <clears throat> and again, I want to like emphasize the tentativeness of this. Right? It's sort of like uh, you've got to kind of, it, it won't always be entirely clear uh, whether, you, whether or not you have it right. But uh, I want to encourage you to write things down to check. Uh, here, here's a particularly good reason for that. And that is that uh, a significant amount of the processing that uh, uh, humans have, right? Because our, you know, we're just like meat computers is sort of what we are. <laughs> we just go like, we're computers that are made of meat. And uh, like uh, a big part of our uh, processing is our visual cortex. And uh, in, in some ways, the, the parts of our brains that think abstractly about math are not so well connected to the visual part. So how do you get uh, how do you get the abstract part that's fairly good at considering abstract mathematical things to start uh, talking, uh, you know, uh, efficiently with your visual cortex? How do you get that to work? 
You write it down. Uh, you know, it's like uh, you've got to get it out of the abstract part of your head onto the page so that uh, it can get back into your eyes, into your visual cortex, and you can say, oh yeah, okay, that's right. Or it's not. So if you ever find yourself teaching, one of the best tricks that, uh, that, that, you, can, that you can get is uh, you'll hear it all the, now that I've pointed out, you probably hear it in this class and in other classes. Someone will say, uh, I have a question. And I say, okay, please tell me. And then uh, they start asking the question, and then they say, never mind. <laughs> Uh, my, my theory, my working hypothesis for what's happening there is that uh, it's not so clear what's happening in that part of their brain, and then they say it, and it goes out their mouth, into their ear, <laughs> into the, to the auditory processing units of the brain, and then they're able to bring some attention to bear on the thing, and then, <laughs> never mind, <laughs> I get it. Uh, another one is that uh, if someone asks for help on a math question, even if you don't know what, uh, even if you have no idea, how to do it. You can just say, uh, can you explain to me what you have so far? Can you draw a picture? And then most of the time if you just say that enough, they say, oh, never mind, I see it now. <laughs> Good. Uh, so making that uh, substitution. N you know, I say that, all, all that stuff. Uh, the reason why I say it is because uh, you know, um, on the one hand, it's kind of nice when a student turns in a blank page because uh, it's, you know, doesn't require much work from me. But uh, it's also, you know, kind of sad because what that usually means, not every time, sometimes it's because the student doesn't have any idea what to do. But uh, uh, very often it means that a student tried to just like imagine the, how the question should play out and couldn't imagine it and didn't uh, ever give themselves the opportunity to look at something on the page. And I don't want that to be the case for any of y'all. Okay, <clears throat> so substituting it, uh, we have 1 over uh, k squared uh, dk over 2. Any question about uh, getting to this place? Okay, so now I'm going to make an error. Someone please tell me what my error is. Uh, so uh, the half, okay, I can do that. Uh, and then 1 over k squared, uh, definitely that's a logarithm of k squared plus a constant. Got it. Yeah, yeah, the one that looks like 1 over, you know, whatever. That's the logarithm one, right? Ah, but right. Uh, so remember, the logarithm rule uh, that we know, it's the one that looks like this, w to exponent negative 1 dw, uh, and in your uh, book, and in other places, very often it's written like this, 1 over w uh, dw, like that. That's the logarithm rule, 1. But because uh, this one, you know, is kind of similar visually, uh, very often students get a, f uh, a false match, an incorrect match against that one in their head, and then, and then this thing happens. Okay, does everyone see that this is not right? So, uh, then this should be, uh, you know, you could write it like this, uh, half antiderivative k to negative 2 dk. So then writing it in, uh, uh, with, that, with that exponent form, with a negative exponent, to me anyway, makes it more clear that it's a, that it's a power rule. So this will be half. This will be half. Uh, that's my warning to myself to get ready to give the quiz. If you heard my phone ding ding just then. Uh, sorry, I lost track of what I was. Oh, yeah, right here, power rule. Uh, k to negative 1, negative 1, plus a constant. OK, and then this isn't the answer because we needed to get back to the original variable. Uh, so, uh, getting it back to the original variable, this would be uh, half times, uh, what, z squared plus 6z uh, to negative 1, divide by negative 1, 
plus a constant. Really? Probably. Where is it? I don't follow you. Okay, wait a second. I think I follow you. Uh, so, like, maybe, maybe I uh, simplify this just a little bit, and I'll write uh, negative half, so that's moving that negative to be with the constant, and then writing this one like this, 1 over k uh, plus a constant like that. And I think you're asking, why do I not use the log rule here? Okay? Why not? So, notably, notably, uh, uh, to some extent, this step right here, this green step, the step that I'm labeling with green here, that's the, spent on, that's the, that's the step on which the, the antiderivative was spent, right? So notice that uh, it's antiderivative all along, you know, all the way down, and then from here to here, we invoke the power rule. So, here, it's no longer an antiderivative. In a sense, like uh, the, the, the calculus toll was paid here to here. This is not an antiderivative anymore. Now, I agree entirely that uh, if, we were, if we were computing the antiderivative of 1 over k, we'd use the log rule. But uh, we're not computing the antiderivative of 1 over k. Other questions? OK, so uh, please put away your things. Uh, you're permitted a uh, scientific calculator, uh, but, but uh, nothing else. Uh, and uh, I have a couple scientific calculators you can borrow if, uh, uh, if you're in need. <laughs>